Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in the West Baldwin United Methodist Church online worship. And uh, we are here today, Pastor Bo and my husband, Tony, our daughter, Hope, and of course, the cats will come and make an appearance, uh, Luna and Franklin, and uh, we are wishing you well this lovely fall morning. For announcements, we have um, just the uh, online fellowship follows at 11. All are welcome. You'll find on our Facebook page the um, bulletin information so you can participate in the litanies in worship if you would like. Also, uh, you'll find our contact information. So if you would like the prayer list sent to you or the newsletters sent once a month, um, any of the weekly emails that go out, you can um, let us know, and we'll be happy to add you to that list. Uh, on Monday, tomorrow, 8 a.m., we have our Zoom Bible study. We're studying um, Philip the Evangelist. And tomorrow evening, those of you on the uh, Staff Parish Relations Committee, we have a Zoom meeting um, online. And then next Sunday, I wanted to remind you that it is communion, so if you uh, want to plan ahead and have some elements prepared, not only is it our monthly communion, but it is the first Sunday in October is World Communion Sunday. So all those who follow Jesus and um, around the world in many different denominations will be celebrating World Communion and, of course, our online worship and fellowship time. So those are our announcements. Did we have a evangel minute? Yes. Okay. So good morning. Um, I think many of you have, have heard and are aware that uh, my mother passed away unexpectedly on, on Thursday. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to share, um, you know, from her perspective and what she, she has shared with me, um, being hearing impaired and, and a little shy, she found it difficult to to be in a church setting to actually be in worship with people. And you know, one of the silver linings of us experimenting with this online service is uh, once I you know post it to you know Facebook and with with notes, and I would make a copy and post it to YouTube. YouTube has a, a the ability to provide closed captioning. And because of her hearing disability, she found that to be very useful and would actually respond back to certain things that were, were raised, uh, you know, either prayers or uh, Pastor Bo's sermon, you know, anything that might have been said. And, and believe it or not, it actually does a pretty good job of, of translating uh, lyrics. So I, I raise that as, as awareness, you know, it, it is a new ministry for us, fa fairly new now. I know we've been doing it for, for six months, and I hope to continue doing it as we move and combine our in-person services, and we can do more in the future to one on, you know, in-person slash online service. And the reason I think that's important, because we do reach people for that, for whatever reason, can't uh, or, 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 or don't feel comfortable uh, joining us, um, you think of uh, Paul and, and Marilyn with with their health concerns recently, and uh, trying to be careful uh, with with following the, the social distancing guidelines. And others in our congregation, they have taken full advantage of the online offerings, whether it is the online services or the online fellowship, and it's a way for us to stay connected. And we know that there are many people that follow the church or follow us as we share those videos that go back and look at it and reach back to us, whether it's uh, people that are, are shut-ins in the community, family members of, of uh, people in the congregation, uh, people that used to live in the area that moved away. It, it's a, it's a, a, a way to, to reach out. It's, it's an important ministry uh, to continue. But all of that being said, it is not intended to replace the physical worship that we need to have. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 20, for, for where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there among them. 
So there is an importance, there is an expectation that we do gather to, to celebrate and honor our, our Lord and, and, and Jesus Christ. So the, the, the intent of the online ministry is only to uh, uh, add on to, to the ministries that are in place today. But we know that it, 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 these, these uh, online ministries are reaching people uh, in wider circles than we would normally reach. So again, thank you for your support, for, for sharing these online videos, for spreading the word that we offer these for those that may be curious um, or for whatever reason, um, maybe they don't feel comfortable in, in a church building. And that's something, you know, our, our church body will, will talk about how we can be creative in the future. But uh, again, thank you. Uh, for for supporting this new newish ministry as as we go forward amen and now we will prepare our hearts and minds for worship with the prelude ago, Jesus said, the last will be first and the first will be last, and we have not yet understood it. We come to your table for a symbolic meal, swallowing your approval of our beliefs, which was not on the plate, but never being nourished and changed. We, haven't, we have put the ritual meal of bread and juice above the relationship with you. We want more. And yet we have not understood what we have received. Open our eyes to the truth. The meals of bread and fish always had leftovers. They were spontaneous meals to feed crowds, hungering for abundance, security, hope, and kindness. Even the disciples misunderstood that feeding and being fed at table together is the symbol of God's kingdom. Forgive us for those not at the table who are not fed. Forgive us for, 
failing to see that your kindness is enough for all of our needs. We are drenched to overflowing with your love. You give us so much that we must share your love or drown. You became one of us and sacrificed yourself in order to meet us where we are. The spiritual law of our sharing is that in giving we receive. The spiritual law of sin or separation from you is answered in forgiveness and reconciliation at your table. It is in being forgiven and joining the community at the table that we learn to love like you love, Lord. The meal heals, the fellowship encourages, the Lord inspires, the spirit connects. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn, again, you can find it in our Faith We Sing of the Methodist hymnals or on hymnary.org online. They'll know we are Christians, 22-23. interpretation so we understand with you 
all things are possible. We are never alone. Amen. The first scripture reading is Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus was leaving, he saw a tax collector named Matthew sitting at the place for paying taxes. Jesus said to him, Come with me. Matthew got up and went with him. Later, Jesus and his disciples were having dinner at Matthew's house. Many tax collectors and other sinners were also there. Some Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and other sinners? Jesus heard them and answered, Healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. Go and learn what the scriptures mean when they say, Instead of offering sacrifices to me, I want you to be merciful to others. I didn't come to invite good people to be my followers. I came to invite sinners. In Luke 14, verses 1 through 6. One Sabbath, Jesus was having dinner in the home of an important Pharisee, and everyone was carefully watching Jesus. All of a sudden, a man with swollen legs stood up in front of him. Jesus turned and asked the Pharisees and the teachers of the law of Moses, Is it right to heal on the Sabbath? But they did not say a word. Jesus took hold of the man, then he healed him and sent him away. Afterwards, Jesus asked the people, If your son or ox falls into a well, wouldn't you pull him out right away, even on the Sabbath? There was nothing they could say. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. is coming to the table of God, Jesus' lived metaphor for the Christian culture, and is a reminder to next Sunday where we celebrate World Communion. Another reminder. Richard Rohr, our author of um, Jesus' Plan for a New World, a contemporary U.S. Franciscan friar, a contemplative, and an author, writes, Jesus didn't want his community to have a social ethic. He wanted it to be a social ethic. Today we look at the defining symbol of God's kingdom culture and how it is different from the world's culture. That symbol is Jesus' community at the table. Think about all the times religious leaders and rule-following upstanding members of the community criticized Jesus for eating with people. He ate with tax collectors who were Jewish collaborators with Rome and sinners. They criticized who he shared his table with. He ate with Pharisees and lawyers. They criticized the, that he ate too much. He acted like the wealthy, eating to excess when others starve. He was invited and ate with untouchables like lepers and he invited himself to dine with hated hypocrites one thing becomes clear jesus means to tell us something through his community at the table somehow for centuries even millennia we missed this simple fact the heart of the original way of jesus was defined by his instructions to his disciples in training where he sent out the 70 or 72. In uh, Luke 10, 4 through 9, don't take along a money bag or a traveling bag or sandals. Don't waste time greeting people on the road. As soon as you enter a home, say, God bless this home with peace. If the people living there are peace-loving, 
your prayer for peace will bless them. But if they are not peace-loving, your prayer will return to you. Stay with the same family, eating and drinking whatever they give you, because workers are worth what they earn. Don't move around from house to house. If the people of a town welcome you, eat whatever they offer. Heal their sick and say God's kingdom will soon be here. In short, disciples like us are supposed to travel light, stick mostly to family spaces, share healing and hope and the kingdom, all in community around a table, and receive in return welcome, peace, and acceptance, or an extension of home. As we've said in recent weeks, we have an addiction, habits of attitude, thought, and behavior, to our own will. We must commit to God's will in order to find God's kingdom. Also, God's kingdom is reached by building bridges from the side of the outcasts and the least among us to the rich and powerful and highest among us. And when these opposites come together, there's conflict that can only be overcome by unity and peace. The groundwork of building bridges, um, of having unity and peace with one another across many differences, is not causing problems for others who are trying to follow God to the best of their ability. The yardstick for measuring our success in understanding the kingdom of the kingdom culture is how we treat the poor, the outcasts of society and religion, the expendable people. Richard Rohr again writes, institutional religion tends to idolize the law to make who's in and who's out ends in themselves. When the law gets in the way of human compassion, Jesus simply disregards the law. He expresses its meaning. Our reading from Matthew, who was writing to the established Jewish community, is a common description of Jesus eating with those considered sinners or traitors and his friends. They should not be welcome at a good Jewish table. Jesus' ans Jesus answers, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. The lesson for us, disciples of Jesus, is go to people who don't know about this kingdom culture, this kingdom of God. Spread the good news and the kingdom culture. This means associating with people who, for a variety of reasons, would never set foot in a church. Our Luke reading, which was written to the poor and the outcasts to assure them that they are in invited and included, is a description of Jesus eating on the Sabbath day with the right people, Pharisees and lawyers. But they were only there to catch him doing something wrong so they could prosecute him. The poor sick man who has followed Jesus right into the important Pharisee's home, we'll come back to that in a few minutes, Jesus knows the Pharisees want to trap him, so he asks them if it's okay to heal on the Sabbath. They don't answer. So you can feel the tension in this moment rising. They just can't wait for Jesus to do something that gets them in trouble and they can pounce. Jesus touched the man shocking in itself because he was unclean, healed him, and sent him on his way. Before the Pharisees can spring their trap, Jesus says, if your child or important livestock fell into a well on the Sabbath day, wouldn't you pull them out, or would you wait for the next day? There's a few lessons here. Everyone is welcome at Jesus' table. And his table is the table where he currently sits, the table where he's invited. The poor sick man feels allowed to have access to Jesus. 
The important Pharisee no doubt didn't like this man showing up in his home any more than we would if a beggar walked in the door of our home and asked us for help. But that's the point. This is the very person and the very place where we are supposed to help. As we heard in, in Luke 10 earlier, to train and develop disciples, Jesus sent out pairs of 70 or 72 of the ones he considered ready for this task. The lesson is, a disciple's workplace is never a church building or place of worship. A disciple's workplace is the community at the table with those who don't know about the kingdom of God. The Lord's Table. Again from Richard Rohr. Religion is all the things you normally go through to meet God. The gospel is the way you will see and think after you've met God. The gospel is the effect of the God encounter. Religion, though it often stirs some desire, is also the most common and disguised way of avoiding the encounter with God. We know that Jesus established the Lord's Supper on or around the Passover just before he was executed. What we don't realize is how we, the church, over time, have changed Jesus' teaching to fit our needs. Think of all the times in the New Testament that Jesus is in a community at the table. In addition to the ones from our readings today, two more significant examples of Jesus' community at the table would be the Last Supper, and one of his miraculous feedings of the crowds. They appear in Matthew 14 or 15, Luke um, 9, Mark 6 or 8, John 6. In the Last Supper, we have a presumably full Passover meal. When the meal's over, Jesus took bread and wine from the remains of what they had eaten and used them as examples for a symbolic meal in which Jesus, God himself, is consumed and nourishes us at the table to live out his kingdom on earth. In the miraculous feedings, we have crowds interested in what Jesus is saying about God's kingdom. They are men, women, and children, probably poor since they are so persistent in hearing Jesus over being in the synagogue with the rabbis. It comes time to provide for the necessities of life, and Jesus basically takes the potluck items brought forward to share, and then they become a meal for everyone, always with baskets of leftovers. There is abundance, plenty, enough. This is real food that fed real people and probably real poor, outcast, or rejected people seeking a relationship with God. Isn't it more likely that at the end of that Last Supper, Jesus added symbolism to a practice already well established by Jesus of creating community at a table? Yet the bread and wine are what we emphasize in Holy Communion. The early church, right after you know the 12 disciples started um, getting new converts to the faith, they would share real food at a table, an agape feast or a love feast, and then have the elements of communion, the ritual, with the community at this table was offered at the end. At some point in time, people started bringing their own food, not sharing food. Imagine that today. You and everyone in your community bringing their own food and having to eat that. They probably still had the ritual communion elements at the end, but Paul, Apostle Paul, rebuked a church that allowed the poor to go hungry during the mealtime while the rich enjoyed a big meal. Eventually, 
the church took on just the symbolic meal and left the rest of the table. I think they left a lot of Jesus' message about what happens at a table. How different would our concept of worship and Holy Communion be if we instead had an abundant potluck, the fish and bread agape meal, with the unity and community of the living body of Christ. It doesn't mean that the ritual's bad or wrong. It has offered many people comfort and a way into God's presence. That doesn't change the simple fact that the community at the Lord's table is supposed to be a very different kind of meal, open to the beggars that come in off the street and the pilgrims in search of healing. Richard Rohr again writes, possibly the two traditions can come together, bread and wine plus the agape potluck, bread and fish. We are to recognize Jesus himself in the elements of Holy Communion, but we are also to recognize the living body of Christ, the elements of Holy Communion, and the Holy Communion itself. It's meant to be a meal in which the body recognized itself, defined itself, and declared the kingdom world order and its central purpose, which was to be Jesus in a particular space and time. The community at the table works on many levels. There's the unity of sharing the same food together, there's the symbolism of the arrangement and seating at the table. Without Jesus' influence, it often represents the current world order. Think of a, a, a sumptuous table feast in a movie. Who's seated next to the most important person at the head of the table? And then the furthest people away. There was symbolism to that arrangement. That's the ground from which we have to build the bridge of the kingdom. As people accept change at the community at the table, then they begin to change their thinking about the culture beyond it. They begin transforming to the kingdom culture. Where are you in the community at the table? Amen. We continue our worship by turning to our prayer requests, joys, and concerns. Um, we have a few from the emailed uh, list to update. Um, Pat uh, had heard from Dot Hart, and she is doing well. Um, in answer to all of our many months of prayers, her sister Annette, the test results she was waiting on, came back with uh, very positive results, meaning uh, no signs of cancer, no more treatment scheduled, and just a yearly checkup scheduled um, to check back in with her. Um, also that Wes fell um, while uh, Pat was away, and then this week while she's returned, his neck was hurting, so they did take him to the ER and they confirmed it just seems to be muscle strain. So we ask that uh, um, God's healing presence be with Wes and give him some comfort. Um, George uh, was able to have his first treatment um, and he had no bad or adverse reactions to it, which is good. And hopefully that will get rid of the symptoms that he was having. And uh, Tony had brought up last week the McNew family and their daughter, 12-year-old with COVID, who was um, similar to our, our own Paul Hopkins, put on a ventilator and then was having complications of, with her liver that they needed to, her kidneys, that they needed to treat, yes, kidneys, and, um, and has now passed away on Friday. Um, so we, we offer prayers of comfort for the McNew family in Florida for their loss. 
our own Paul continues to um, struggle with recovery from COVID. Um, he, uh, he remains uh, at the hospital right now and probably will be going to rehab before being able to go home. And in hearing about the loss of Barbara Landsberg, um, Tony's mother and my mother-in-law, um, he uh, sent along a Eugene O'Neill quote, man is born broken, he spends his life mending, God's grace is the glue. And I think that captures the place of many of us right now. Leah asked for prayers, her um, medical discernment and wisdom as well, her surgery having to be rescheduled because of the backlog of scheduling. It could be a year um, before she gets rescheduled. She has a ruptured disc in her back. She's also been diagnosed with polymyalgia, which at least helps in addressing the pain. So she has some more pain medications to try. And we just ask for prayers for healing and comfort for quicker solutions to this problem. And uh, um, Wilma lifted up Larry, who's been having difficulties with his COPD. And so we just pray for Larry for easy and comforting breath. Pray for the family, for God's healing presence and comfort. Tony especially raised Glenn in the passing of his, his mom. And uh, we just raise all of the family for prayers. Any others that have come in on Facebook? Let us be in the spirit of prayer. God, we know that you hold us in the palms of your hands. You care for us. You want what's best for us. We lean into that in our times of need. We have brought before you concerns for comfort, healing, wisdom and discernment, peace. But there are concerns in our heart we've not raised and we lift them up to you now. And we say together, Lord, hear our prayers. We also know that hand in hand with grief is joy. Hand in hand with difficult times is beauty. Our natural world is exploding with color. There have been answers to prayers that we have made. We just cling to those joys. There are joys in our heart we did not raise and we lift them up to you now. And we say together, Lord, hear our praise. And we continue with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have our moment of acknowledging our presentation of tithes and offerings. Uh, many at the morning worship this morning in person were able to uh, give their tithes and offerings to the offering plate. And for those at home, you can send your um, tithes and offerings to the address on the bulletin. And your gifts and all are appreciated in these difficult times for balancing our budget and staying financially healthy. 
but we also encourage you to think of the ways in which you give to one another during these pandemic and difficult and divisive times, the ways in which we come together, the ways in which we care for one another, how you have cared for others and how others have cared for you during this offertory. Then we'll have our doxology and prayer of dedication. I'm gonna do a uh, special dedication uh, for my mom and I think uh, the rest of the Lansford family will appreciate it. Sing, sing a song, sing out loud, sing out strong. of the daisy. So your love is perfect in the humble heart as in the most highly favored. 
Let all our gifts and offerings work together for your good and to your glory. Amen. Our last hymn is the one we have been uh, singing uh, this month with um, Building Bridges, the... Um, I'm sure I have it somewhere. Find it. I think it is. From the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. mind, save a naked intent stretching out to God. Leave it stripped of every particular idea about God, and keep only the simple awareness that God is the great I am. Let your prayers be that which I am I offer to you, O Lord, without looking to any quality of your being, but only to the fact that you are this and nothing more. Amen. today, um, I'm going to dedicate one more song to my mom. It was one of her favorites. Um, I've introduced this to the music team, not that anyone didn't know it before, but definitely uh, mom's impact on me and the music that I grew up listening to. 
Nothing's worried. 